Welcome back, everybody. This is a session called Exploring the Potential for Reverse Transfer in British Columbia. Reverse transfer was a concept that I first came across a few years ago when I was reading about some of the transfer systems down uh, in the United States. Uh, I've often said here in BC, we are the victim of our own success when it comes to transfer, as students routinely move on from an institution before they complete a credential. But what if there was a way to retroactively receive a credential after you leave an institution? And what if you could use the transfer system to accomplish such a feat? Well, it is my pleasure to once again welcome Dr. Fiona McQuarrie, who is going to talk about the concept of reverse transfer and whether something like this could or even should take place here in British Columbia. As always, she is going to be joining us at the top of the hour to uh, field your questions and participate in the discussion. So I hope you enjoy this video and we'll see you uh, at the live session in a few minutes. Thank you, Mike, and good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Fiona McCory. I'm the Special Projects Officer at BCCAT, and I'm here to facilitate this session on reverse transfer and its potential in the BC transfer system. This is what the session is going to cover. First, we're going to look at the definition of reverse transfer, and then we're going to go over how reverse transfer agreements work in the United States. We'll then look at the opportunities and the challenges to potentially using reverse transfer in BC. And then the floor will be open for discussion on whether reverse transfer would be useful or if it would be feasible in the BC transfer system. BCCAT is currently preparing a report on this issue. So we would really like to hear your ideas and your input. So let's get started. What is reverse transfer? First, let's take a look at how it works. It starts with a student enrolling in a two-year credential program at a post-secondary institution. I'll be calling this the two-year institution. Usually the credential program is an associate degree program, but the principles behind reverse transfer can apply to any credential. After the student enrolls in that credential program, they then transfer to another post-secondary institution, the four-year institution, before they finish that two-year credential. If they acquire credits at that four-year institution that would complete the program at the two-year institution, reverse transfer allows them to transfer those credits back to the two-year institution and receive the two-year credential. But this happens while they continue to be enrolled at the four-year institution. They don't have to complete their four-year degree to receive the two-year degree at the other institution. Reverse transfer started to be used in the US around 2010. And since then, there's been a fair amount of research on its outcomes. One benefit to reverse transfer is that it increases the credential completion rate. Sometimes this is hard to track because oftentimes the numbers of students that have benefited from reverse transfer are counted in categories with students that have completed unfinished degrees through other means. So it's difficult to tell how many students have actually received a degree through reverse transfer. However, US colleges like reverse transfer because it increases their credential completion rates. And this is particularly important in those states or those systems where the success of those institutions is partly or measured upon their credential completion rates. Another benefit that's been identified for reverse transfer is that it's motivating for students. Uh, if students receive a credential while they're still working towards another credential, that is a way for them to be motivated to finish that second credential. It also gives them the opportunity to acquire multiple credentials. And one other benefit that's been identified through qualitative research with students is that reverse transfer can be a safety net for them. When they transfer to the four-year institution, if they run into academic problems or they end up not completing their degree at the four-year institution, reverse transfer gives them a safety net where they can still receive a degree, even if they don't complete the four-year degree that they transferred into. So this is how reverse transfer agreements work in the United States. 
the agreements can be between individual institutions or they can be across systems, across states, across jurisdictions, or even within cities like New York where there are uh, citywide post-secondary systems. After a student transfers, the process of reverse transfer can start in two different ways. One is that the four-year institution, which the student has transferred into, reviews student transcripts for transfer students after a year or so, and sees how many credits the students have acquired since they transferred. They use that process to identify students who might be eligible for reverse transfer and notify them. In other systems, it's the student's job to know when or to be able to identify when they have reach the number of credits or courses that they need for reverse transfer, and they contact their four-year and two-year institutions to let them know that they would like to apply for reverse transfer. But in either case, uh, the institutions have to share their transcripts. So a key part of the process is a student giving their consent for the two-year and the four-year post-secondary institutions to share their transcripts with each other. So the transcripts go to the two-year institution and the two-year institution then conducts a degree audit to see if the student has completed the requirements for the associate degree at that two-year institution. If they have, then they are awarded uh, a two-year credential. If they haven't, then usually the two-year institution uh, does some advising work with them to identify the missing courses or credits that they would need to receive the associate degree and the student can reapply for the credential when these are required. And one additional feature of many of these systems is that this whole process uh, occurs at no cost to the student. Usually uh, students would incur costs from things like ordering transcripts or applying for graduation but part of the incentive that's built into many reverse transfer agreements is that those fees are waived for the students. So essentially they can acquire the two-year credential at minimal or no cost to them. So now we're going to look at the idea of reverse transfer in relation to BC's own transfer system. So when reverse transfer is discussed in BC, it's mostly discussed in relation to associate degrees. BC is the only province in Canada that awards associate degrees, and in the BC post-secondary system, there are two types of associate degrees, the Associate of Arts and the Associate of Science. There are 23 BC post-secondary institutions that offer associate degrees, and that includes six private institutions and 17 public institutions. Six institutions offer the Associate of Arts degree alone, uh, and the other 17 offer both the Associate of Arts and the Associate of Science degree. 16 institutions offer specializations or concentrations within the Associate of Arts or the Associate of Science programs. There are some features of BC's transfer system that would help support reverse transfer. As we know, BC already has a very well-developed transfer system and there's a good understanding and awareness of transfer credit in the BC transfer system. Another feature of the system that would support reverse transfer is that BC has a multi-directional credit system where credits go uh, among different types of institutions. This is unlike many parts of the US where transfer go tends to go one way from colleges to universities. Also because of BC's well-developed transfer system, there's also very good communication between BC transfer system member institutions. This would support reverse transfer in that it would be very easy to exchange student transcripts once a student gives their permission for that sharing. And it would also make it easier for institutions to work together in supporting or developing reverse transfer agreements. Also, BC's associate degrees have a provincially mandated curriculum which has specific breadth requirements and specific credit requirements. This would also support reverse transfer because the requirements and the content of associate degrees are the same at every institution in BC that offers associate degrees. The associate degree programs also undergo regular provincial level quality assurance review. And this would further ensure program quality and ensure consistency 
across institutions and across programs. However, there's also some challenges to offering reverse transfer in BC. One is that associate degrees are not as widely recognized in BC as they are in the US. And that applies both to the post-secondary system and also to employers and other stakeholders. Students might not put a high value on the opportunity to obtain an associate degree if they perceive it as not having value for them either in their academic or in their work careers. So the possibility to acquire an associate degree, uh, whether it be uh, at one institution or whether it be by reverse transfer, may not carry a lot of importance for students if they are not aware of associate degrees or if they don't perceive them to have as large a value as other types of degrees. Also within the BC transfer system, the associate degree framework requires that all courses that are applied towards completion of an Associate of Arts or an Associate of Science must be transferable to UBC Vancouver, UBC Okanagan, UVic, Simon Fraser, or the University of Northern BC. This restricts some of the potential for reverse transfer. For example, a student who started an associate degree at Okanagan College and then transferred to another institution such as Selkirk College could not use Selkirk's courses for reverse transfer unless those courses from Selkirk were also transferable to one of those five universities. And this would be true even if the courses fulfilled Okanagan's associate degree requirements. So although we have a multi-institutional, multi-level transfer system in BC, this requirement uh, that the associate courses be transferable to these five universities could restrict the scope of the possibilities for reverse transfer. Along similar lines, uh, associate degree enrollment is not consistently tracked in BC. At some institutions, students enroll specifically in associate degree programs, but in others, the associate degree is an exit credential, meaning that the student applies for the degree uh, when they graduate and they're not formally enrolled in the associate degree program while they're at the institution. This could make it difficult both to track the number of potential uh, uh, associate degree recipients through reverse transfer. It could also make it difficult to track the number of uh, graduates uh, moving on to other institutions or transfer students moving on to other institutions that could be eligible for reverse transfer. Along similar lines, uh, several of BC's public institutions offer both associate degrees and undergraduate degrees. Uh, it might not technically be reverse transfer if a student did not complete an associate degree at one institution and then got an undergraduate degree from that same institution. But if a student wanted to acquire both an associate degree and an undergraduate degree at one institution, then uh, they might run into issues around residency requirements or policies that limit how credit from one credential can be applied to completion of another credential. Uh, usually these are called second or subsequent degree policies. And of course, like with any transfer agreement, there's staff time and resources needed to develop it and to administer it. For reverse transfer agreements, uh, there would need to be staff time and resources put towards potentially identifying uh, reverse transfer candidates. Uh, it could also involve time and resources to conduct degree audits when students apply for reverse transfer. And possibly it could also involve uh, advising time and resources to advise students who have not met the requirements for reverse transfer, but would like to pursue that route. And it's important to note too, that most of this work in a reverse agreement, uh, reverse transfer agreement usually falls upon the two year or the sending institution. So that's what the landscape looks like for the potential for reverse transfer in British Columbia. So now I'd like to open up the floor and ask these questions. First, do you think reverse transfer could work in BC? And secondly, do you think BC students would be interested in using reverse transfer if it existed? And finally, would reverse transfer have benefits for BC's post-secondary institutions or for programs within these institutions? Let's hear what you think.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. It is now my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Fiona McQuarrie, who is live with us in the Zoom flesh. Uh, good morning, Fiona. Good morning. Um, we have a, a question to hear from the audience. This is from Debbie Lynn from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She's asking, would the reverse transfer model uh, need to reduce the residency requirement where a minimum number of credits need to be completed at the original institution? What are your thoughts on that? Um, two things. One is the terms of the agreement are really up to the institutions that are participating. So if the original institution wanted to set that minimum to uh, uphold its re residency requirements, it certainly could do that. But another uh, component is that most of the agreements that I looked at in the United States uh, set a mim minimum number of credits that the student has to have completed at the original institution to be uh, eligible for reverse credit, reverse transfer at all. I think the lowest that I saw was 15 credits and the highest was probably around 45, 50 credits. So really if uh, institutions uh, want to maintain their residency requirement to participate in reverse transfer agreements, that's entirely up to them. You know, you mentioned something to us when we were in the green room having a chat there about uh, how you recently received some data regarding students that have moved on uh, from completing associate degrees here in British Columbia. Um, I wonder if you want to maybe just share a little bit about what uh, we uh, were talking about with regards to um, potential students that might be eligible for a reverse transfer. Yeah, um, there's some difficulties in tracking associate degree uh, students in British Columbia, partly because at some institutions, the associate degree is an exit credential. So the student isn't actually enrolled in the associate degree program while they're at the institution. They only receive it once they apply to graduate and they apply to receive that degree. Also, most of the data uh, that's collected in BC is from our public post-secondary institutions. And there are seven private post-secondary institutions that uh, offer associate degrees. So that part of the data uh, is not being, currently not being captured. Um, so the students that would be eligible for reverse transfer in BC theoretically uh, meet a couple of different criteria. First, they would have to be enrolled at a uh, institution that offers an associate degree. They would have to transfer out of that institution um, without completing or receiving the associate degree. And they would have to transfer to an institution that offers undergraduate degrees. So tracking all of those three, finding students that meet all three of those criteria is somewhat imprecise. And we should keep in mind also that um, part of what drives reverse transfer is student demand. Uh, the big question is, if there was reverse transfer in BC, would it be valuable to students? Would it be an incentive for them to um, uh, continue at a four-year institution and transfer credit back and get their associate degree. Is the associate degree valuable or useful to them? So we don't know that part of it, but um, from the data that I've seen, and I will emphasize again that this is very preliminary data and it's certainly not perfect. Um, in the 2019-2020 academic year, there were probably around 800 students uh, that met those three criteria. And, and, and as you said at the beginning, there are seven private institutions that offer associate degree programs that their numbers would not be included in that data. So it's probably reasonable to uh, conjecture that that number would be higher uh, if that data were to, were to include private institutions. Possibly, yeah. Possibly. But again, we, we, we also, the, the, the key question is, would students use reverse transfer if it was available? And that, that's the big part that uh, the data doesn't capture as well. Yeah, and so I, I want to touch upon that point. I know we have another question here from Rachel, which I'm going to get, get to in a minute. You know, uh, early in my undergraduate years, I started at uh, Langara College, and then I transferred after one year to the University of British Columbia. And uh, I learned after the fact that I had actually completed all the courses to meet a certificate at Langara. I just didn't know about it until after I transferred. So I guess my first question is, can I still get that credential? Um, but, but more broadly, um, are you aware of how uh, well received this uh, concept of reverse transfer is? Uh, I know it's not available here in Canada, but in the United States, it's been around for over 10 years. Um, how is it being perceived by students? Um, to some extent, it depends on which field the student is studying in. Um, associate degrees are fairly common in the health-related occupations. And uh, in that field, they're more uh, accepted uh, as a credential for uh, a qualification for occupations. 
Um, the other thing though, is that in the US, their associate degrees tend to fall into two categories. One is a terminal associate degree where it's specifically designed to qualify students for uh, the workplace. And the student really isn't taking the associate degree with the expectation that they would use it to transfer. And the other kind of associate degree is an associate degree that is designed for, for transfer, that students would take that for two years at a, usually at a community college and then transfer to a degree granting institution to get their undergraduate degree. Um, something interesting that's happened literally in the last couple of weeks is that uh, a number of community colleges in California, uh, state colleges have been granted the ability to um, grant undergraduate degrees, which is a really big change in that system. Uh, and part of the reason for that was that the colleges found that they were uh, losing uh, students to degree granting institutions for programs that they had the capacity to offer themselves. And I was reading some reports on this that suggested that part of the reason for this is that reverse transfer in that system anyway is not as popular as it used to be. Um, that students who are going for an undergraduate degree generally don't see the value uh, to their career aspirations or their personal aspirations, and they would prefer to have an undergraduate degree. So essentially they're using the uh, associate degree as two years at college and whether they get the credential or not is not important to them. And so for this change in California is designed to let colleges retain those students by offering the undergraduate degree programs that seem to be of more value and more interest to the students that uh, are studying with them. Um, there's a question here from the audience from Rachel Jansen. She's asking, hypothetically, could this be applied between different provincial systems? So um, obviously, we don't. there isn't a formal um, reverse transfer program in British Columbia, and I'm not aware of any across Canada, but certainly there are, there are quite a few in the United States. So do you, are you aware of um, students from different states or jurisdictions being able to take advantage of reverse transfer? I didn't come across any. Most of the ones that I looked at were within um, a particular state. That being said, though, in some states uh, where there are also regional and even civic uh, reverse transfer agreements, like the city of New York's uh, publicly funded post-secondary institutions, um, some of those will trans have reverse transfer agreements with state or regional uh, institutions. So there is the possibility for transfer across uh, jurisdictions, but at the U.S. at the moment, at least from my reading, I would say that the, they tend to be within the state, although there's cross-system transfer within individual states. I'm also wondering, in, in, in your research of, of the different jurisdictions down in the United States, do you ever come across situations where, because funding to higher education institutions is often based on credential completion, were there ever any examples of institutions awarding credentials to students who had left without the students applying for those credentials? No, <laughs> as much as they would like to, I'm sure to increase their rates. But one of the key principles uh, that I mentioned was that uh, the student, uh, and this would be true in British Columbia as well, the student has to give uh, explicit consent to have their transcript shared between the two-year and the four-year institution for reverse transfer to be able to happen. So I, given that the student has to explicitly sign off on this, I, I'm guessing there's probably not uh, unclaimed uh, associate degrees floating around there that the stu students don't know about. Okay. Uh, it just shows where my mind goes when it comes to gamifying uh, higher education. Um, there's a couple of comments in the chat that I think are quite uh, informative. Uh, Laura Bushi from CNC, as well as Anna Lee Bolton from University of Canada West, have offered that they, um, when they advise students, they often encourage students to transfer uh, credits back, particularly if they haven't, if they are leaving the institution and haven't completed a credential. So it does appear that there are uh, examples of um, students who are reverse transferring, even if they might not have known that that's what mm -hmm. it's called, um, yeah. or if we had actually uh, analyzed um, that type of activity. Um, Debbie Lynn you, uh, from UBC has another follow-up question uh, related to the associate degrees. Um, are associate degrees in BC well recognized by BC employers? I would say no. Um, there's much higher awareness of it in the United States. Uh, just out of curiosity, I took a look at uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, job listings in the US. They have a very useful function where every couple of months they go through uh, 
job listings um, that are online and they look at uh, how many are requiring certain credentials and how many are requiring so many years of experience and they collate all that data, which is really useful for researchers uh, who are trying to track that sort of thing at a system-wide level. And uh, I, I think in the last data set, there was something like 30% of the listings required an associate degree or higher. And I looked at a couple of uh, job sites uh, online in Canada, and I saw very few uh, postings that were asking for an associate degree as, uh, as a job requirement. So I think partly because British Columbia is the only province in Canada that offers the associate degree that there is fairly low awareness of it, certainly in all of Canada, but I would say I, I perceive a low awareness of it in British Columbia as well. Uh, uh, maybe within true. the post-secondary system more, but definitely uh, externally. Yeah, and it, it is true. Uh, that's also been my uh, observation as well. However, um, there have been studies that show that when students receive a uh, credential kind of at the midway mark of an undergraduate degree, um, they're more likely to go on to completion of a full four-year degree. So there is some value to uh, getting that milestone and receiving a credential, um, at least at the halfway point. Absolutely. I think the, the research shows that there is value to the students because it's an affirmation of the work that they've completed and that they have been successful at that work. And that can be enough to keep them going for the next two years and finish their undergraduate credential as well. Yeah. So uh, to, on that note, then, uh, Langara College, I'm going to come back to you and try to get that certificate that I should have earned back in 1994 <laughs> or whatever it was. <laughs> OK, we have reached uh, time on this one. I want to thank everybody. The chat was lively and uh, lots of good comments and questions. Um, it is close to 1115 right now. Our next session begins at 1130 and you'll want to tune in for that as we are going to be providing an overview of uh, a couple of institutions that have successfully uh, developed and implemented micro-credential uh, programs. So please uh, join us for that at 1130.